So tonight, tonight's topic for CIS 205 is CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-802. That's the second exam, and we'll be covering their exam objectives 1.1 and 1.2. And here are the subjects that I'm going to cover. We're going to start with operating systems, then common features. Upgrade paths will be the last one for objective 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, under objective 1.2, which is installing and configuring operating systems using the most appropriate method, we will be talking about installation methods and media, different types of installation, partitioning hard drives, and miscellaneous setup issues. So let's go ahead and jump into objective 1.1. And the first thing we need to discuss is operating systems. Now, CompTIA is still a little bit behind the times, and they are still testing on Windows XP. So that's something that you're going to need to know. It was an extremely popular operating system that was introduced in 2001. And it comes in several different versions, XP Home, XP Professional, XP Media Center, and XP 64-bit Professional. Uh, there were a couple of other minor versions to it, but those are the ones that you need to know. Uh, XP Home was targeted at the home market, and it had the most basic of capabilities. XP Professional was targeted to the business user, and it added file encryption and remote desktop capabilities. And if you wanted to join a domain instead of a work group, you had to have XP Professional. XP Media Center was Microsoft's entry into the home entertainment world. Uh, they tried to make it a media type center, so they with Media Center, you can watch and record television, listen to music, and watch the DVDs. And thank goodness XP 64-bit Pro came along because that added more memory capability and power. Uh, to take advantage of it, you did have to have a 64-bit processor, CPU. Uh, back when it first came out, that was less common than it is today. I do believe support for XP ended in 2014. Actually, I know it ended in 2014, but I think it actually ended in April of 2014. So it's a legacy system now, but there are still a lot of systems out there using it. Uh, the replacement for XP was Windows Vista. After a much delayed release, it came out in 2007. And it too came in different versions. It came in Home, which is the Home Basic. It's their stripped down, very basic version. It came in Home Premium. And that kind of maps to XP's Media Center. It added more capability. Uh, we were starting to integrate more um, entertainment into our PCs, and that's what Home Premium was for. Uh, Vista Business uh, kind of maps to XP Professional, and that allowed you to join domains and ask also encrypt files. It also added um, something called offline files. What that allowed you to do was to pull a file from a server to your laptop, disconnect from the network, modify the file, and the next time you logged onto the network, it synchronized that file with the server. Uh, there was also Vista Enterprise. Uh, that was only available if you were a Microsoft Software Assurance customer. And that added BitLocker drive encryption. Instead of just being able to encrypt files, you could encrypt the whole drive. And the last version was Vista Ultimate. Um, every feature that was available in all the other ones were available to Vista Ultimate customers. This way, the home user could get those items that were available to the business user and not have to be a software assurance customer. 
Uh, it did also add a little bit more fluff, and that was in themes for desktop and games, not really important. Yeah. Vista was not very popular, um, mainly because it was such a change from XP. Uh, I found Vista to be fairly stable, but to be a bit of a nanny, and we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. The replacement for Vista is Windows 7. Now, it was introduced in 2009, and as all things, it came in several different versions. Uh, Windows 7 Starter uh, is only came in 32-bit. It was small and lightweight. It had a maximum memory of 2 gigs. And it was very basic. Um, it was good for netbooks, which were big at the time. Uh, but it was very basic. I would never install that on a home PC or a regular laptop. Home premium was the, the entry to the home market. Um, they added Arrow to the desktop, which we will discuss a little bit later. Uh, home groups instead of work groups, uh, same idea. And Home Premium also had Windows Media Center. Uh, Windows 7 Professional was the entry level to the business user, and it's all the other versions that allowed you to do join domains instead of home groups, so you had added, added network capability. Uh, Enterprise was the next step up, and as with Vista, the main thing that that got you was BitLocker drive encryption. And to get that, again, you had to be a software assurance customer, a Microsoft software assurance customer. Uh, Windows 7 Ultimate was just like Vista Ultimate. It got you every feature that was available to all the other additions. Uh, and that way, the home user could take advantage of those. Like I said earlier, CompTIA is a little bit behind the times. Thank goodness we don't have to discuss Windows 8. Um, I'm sure that'll be interesting when they incorporate that due to the issues that have come along with that one. Uh, hopefully, Windows 9 will come along soon and replace Windows 8. I haven't had too many problems with it, except for listening to people complain. Mm -hmm. OK. So features, things to, things to remember. 32-bit uh, operating system versus a 64-bit operating system. Um, to take advantage of 64-bit operating system, that is really dependent upon your hardware. Um, it is hard now to buy a 32-bit CPU. You can still do it. And if you do buy one, guess what? You're stuck with a 32-bit operating system, which means that if you're in a 32-bit operating system, you can only have a maximum of 4 gigabytes of RAM. As a matter of fact, if you put 4 gigabytes of RAM in and then you check, you're not going to show 4 gigabytes of RAM. I do believe you're going to show right around 3.5 or 3.58. That's because. Uh, 32-bit operating systems cannot address all of the all of that RAM. And again, you know, if you're running 32-bit OS, you can only run 32-bit software. A lot of software nowadays does come in 64-bit, which usually gives you some more robust robustness, some more stability. Now, 64-bit um, operating system can address a maximum of 192 gigabytes of RAM. That's a lot of RAM. Um, you usually only find that amount of RAM in a server. I haven't come across a home user yet that's come anywhere close, but I'm sure somebody out there is doing it. One of the good things about a 64-bit operating system at least in the Windows world, is you can run 64-bit or 32-bit software. 64-bit operating systems are very backwards compatible, thank goodness. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of upset people out there. 
So now here's some other things that you should remember. These are different features that deal with the memory capabilities of the operating systems and what was available for the different versions. Uh, what I find kind of interesting is that uh, Windows really tries to limit you to a single processor in your motherboard unless you step up and pay the big bucks. Uh, nowadays, you know, I, I hope they change that soon, but that's the way it is. Now let's move on to system requirements. And here again, we've got to discuss XP. Guess what? Its minimum requirement for a processor was a Pentium 233 megahertz. Um, that's pretty slow in today's world. Uh, I tried to look for an older processor to, to buy one new for a system that I was re repairing for a customer. And guess what? He wasn't able to save that money. We had to step up and get him a new processor and a new motherboard because you just can't buy stuff that old anymore. Um, Windows XP recommended 64 megabytes of RAM, but 128 megabits was recommended. Uh, that is in the same category as a processor. Try and buy 64 megabytes of RAM nowadays. You're going to be hard pressed. One of the best things about XP is it was small and compact. You only needed 1.5 gigabytes of hard drive space. Uh, that is small by the today's stand standards, and I kind of wish we'd go back to it because it makes life easier when your operating system is that small. Uh, for your Vista requirements, things were starting to step up a little bit. They didn't uh, restrict you to a Pentium class. They said any processor that was running at 800 megahertz minimum with one gigahertz recommended. Uh, you still can't buy anything that slow anymore unless you get into an ARM, in which case you're not going to probably be running Windows Vista or Windows 7 anyways. The minimum amount of RAM that Vista required was 512 with one gigabyte recommended. And here's where you can start to see the bloat in operating systems. Uh, Vista required a minimum hard drive size of 20 gigabytes, with 15 gigabytes of that being free. That's because when you first loaded it on there, it expanded and took up almost all of the 20 gigabytes before compressing down a little bit on startup to the 15 gigabytes that it required. Actually, it was a little under 15 gigabytes. But they also recommended that you use a minimum size of 40 gigabytes. Uh, they, for video, Vista required video uh, standards. And that was 30, that your video capability had 32 megabytes of RAM available. And that was only for home basic. All other systems required a minimum of 120 megabytes of RAM for video. Now we get into Windows 7. Uh, Windows 7 and Windows 8 both require one gigahertz or faster processor. Um, here again, it's getting hard pressed to find something that slow. You probably still could if you tried, but why well, try? Probably cost you more money anyways. Their minimum RAM requirements was one gigabyte for 32-bit or two gigabytes for 64-bit. Uh, on a side note, I recommend to my customers and others that they go with a 64-bit operating system with a minimum of 4 gigabytes of RAM. That's just what I recommend. That's not um, Microsoft's requirement, but I just find life's easier that way for both me and them. They had a little bit more compact 
operating system, at least for requirements. They required 16 gigabytes of hard drive space. So you could run that same 20 bit, 20 gigabyte drive and still have a more powerful operating system. Much better also, by the way. Uh, for a 64 bit operating system, you needed 20 gigabytes of hard drive space. And as far as memory, or not memory, but as far as video goes, they had no uh, memory requirements, but they did require that your graphics hardware supported DirectX 9 and that it also supported Windows Display Device Model 1.0 or higher. Um, so you didn't have to worry about the LAN, you just had to worry about what it could do. Moving on, almost all of these operating systems offered administrative tools, and those were available through the control panels. All of them offered a way of doing backups built in, and a way to restore your system in case it crashed. They also, after XP, both Vista and Windows 7 offered compatibility mode, so that way you could still use programs that needed the prior operating system. They all offer event viewers, which are a way of checking system logs for errors and events. And depending upon which version that you installed, they all offered a way to join domains, which means you could network with central controls for permissions and log on, which is much easier to manage in a network. They all offered some version that had offline files. They also all had system restore. Uh, that way you could go back to a prior image without affecting files. And even XP offered Windows Defender towards the end, which was a way of protecting against malware. And they all had Windows Firewall available, which was a way of protecting against network intrusions and attacks. So, some other features. Vista introduced Aero. That's a graphics enhancement. Um, made the desktop a little bit more interesting, but it really was a drag on performance. I had a, had a tendency and still do of turning off Aero because I find, well, I guess I'm old school. I don't find the visual enhancements improve my experience that much, and I don't like the degrade degradation in performance. Arrow was improved somewhat in Windows 7, but I still turn it off. Vista and 7, Windows 7, both offer gadgets. What Microsoft calls gadgets, everybody else calls apps. I think Microsoft is moving in that direction as well. In Vista, your gadgets could be added to the sidebar. Uh, with Windows 7, they didn't. They were not restricted to the sidebar. They could be added to the desktop. Now, with the introduction of Windows Vista, we got User Account Control, UAC. That is a way of separating administrative control of the computer from a regular user. And what it really amounts to was a nanny. I'm pretty sure all of you have gone to do something on your computer and had it come up and say, are you sure you want to do that? That is the user account control. Yes, it does nag you. Yes, it is kind of annoying. But it also creates a very secure desktop. It prevents uncontrolled changes, changes that you don't intend from occurring to your system. Uh, BitLocker has been introduced. Uh, and I mentioned it earlier, BitLocker is used to encrypt whole drives, not just files. BitLocker can now also encrypt removable media, as in USB thumb drives, uh, portable hard drives, and even DVDs and CDs. 
One of the things about BitLocker is you cannot compress a drive and then encrypt, or you can, and you cannot encrypt and then compress. You get one or the other, but you can't do both. Uh, with the introduction of Vista, we also got Shadow Copy. Shadow Copy is used in Windows OS to make a copy of what you're working on on the fly. It occurs as you're working on it, so when you're working on a Word document, it's making an exact duplicate and putting it off to the side in case your system goes down. That way, um, if your system does go down, you don't lose what you are working on like you used to. And you can actually configure shadow copy to store that shadow copy almost anywhere. You can tell it to store it on a separate partition of the hard drive, an external hard drive, or a USB drive. With the introduction of Windows Vista, we also got ReadyBoost. Uh, ReadyBoost was uh, Microsoft's method of treating fast external storage, think USB drives, as RAM. Uh, that way you can increase the performance by using USB as additional RAM. The one thing that was required was that your external storage was ready boost enabled. It was actually a, a slick way of taking a slow machine sticking a USB drive into it and increasing its performance tremendously. Uh, so if you ever come across a laptop that has the minimum amount of RAM, I do recommend getting a uh, USB drive and using it for ready boost. Or you could install more RAM. Up to you, I guess. So now let's move on to file structures. Um, so this is something you're going to need to know, and there are three main file structures. There's FAT, FAT32, and NTFS. So when we talk about FAT, File Allocation tech Table, we're actually talking about FAT16. So it's a 16-bit file system. It is a legacy. Uh, FAT16 had a limited capacity. Your max partition could be 4 gigabytes with a max file size of 2 gigabytes. Uh, FAT16 is still supported, uh, but not recommended. Uh, where you will find it is usually on USB drives uh, or other removable media, like in cameras, so on and so forth. They still use FAT16 and FAT32. FAT32 was an improvement on FAT16. It created a 32-bit wide uh, file structure to go along with the 32-bit operating systems. And it is the most common file system that you will find on removable media, USB drives. And it also has a limited capacity. Its max partition is 32 gigabytes with a max file size of 4 gigabytes. With the introduction of NTFS, by the way, which was introduced with Windows 2000, so it was the main file system with the advent of Windows XP, uh, we got a whole bunch more secure. NTFS stands for New Technology File System. It is secure. And if you remember me talking about encryption, well, you really didn't have built-in encryption until NTFS. It's also a much more efficient file structure than FAT30 and FAT. And it offered native compression. You no longer needed to buy software to compress your files. It also had a larger capacity for your file structure, and you could have a two terabyte drive. Now, you're still stuck with that 2 terabyte drive size if you use NTFS. There are some ways around it. Um, they're not really covered in CompTIA's exam, so we're not going to talk about them. NTFS was also 
fairly uh, well fault tolerant. It could detect and recover from some disk related errors without you having to do anything. But I'll also tell you that NTFS is also a whole lot easier to come recover from those disk related errors even when you have to intervene. It was a whole lot better than the FAT file system. So now let's move on to, wow, there we go, upgrade pass. There we go, upgrade pass. So what is an upgrade? Upgrade is moving from one edition or version of an operating system to another. And in upgrades, your system retains all the software applications and files that were already present. When you use an upgrade of a Windows operating system, your old system information is retained in a file called windows.old. And that's stored on your C drive. So if you do an upgrade and you find that a file is missing, look in windows.old. You'll probably find it. Uh, Believe me, that does happen, and it is a great thing that they did that. Uh, systems can can be upgraded to Windows 7 from Windows Vista, but systems cannot be upgraded to Windows 7 from XP. If you want to move from XP to Windows 7, or Windows 8 for that matter, uh, you, you need to do either a clean install, or you're going to need to upgrade to Vista and then move up. Another thing to keep in mind is that if if you're running a 32-bit operating system, you can only upgrade to a 32-bit. Or if you're operating a 64-bit operating system, you can only upgrade to a 64-bit operating system. You cannot mix and match those. Uh, because Microsoft is in this game to make money, and I don't necessarily Blame them. You can only upgrade to the same level that you are at or higher. That means if if you were a, an ultimate user, you can only upgrade to an ultimate version. Uh, you cannot go down to like a home premium. The other way that you can upgrade is you can actually go out and buy a new PC with a new operating system. Now you've got a Consider how to transfer your old stuff from one to the other, and that's where Windows Easy Transfer comes into place. It does take a special cable. You can purchase those. You plug in the two machines so they're connected together, and then you run a wizard, and you pull what you want from the old machine, and you place it on the new machine. Now, if you're in the enterprise, or you have the knowledge on how to do it, there is the user state migration tool that's available through Microsoft. That one's free of charge. But it is the, the business way of making that transition from one box to another box. So now we're done with objective 1.1 of CompTIA's exam 220.802. So now let's move on to objective 1.2. So the first thing we're going to talk about is installation methods and media. So you can, as far as methods go, you can do installation using hard media. We'll explain that here in just a moment. You can do an installation over a network, or you can do an installation using a system image. Now, hard media. Hard media is a USB drive, CD-ROM, portable hard drive, so on and so forth. So guess what? That comes under the different boot methods. Um, you can put it onto a bootable USB drive or CD-ROM or DVD, and you can boot straight from that and install an operating system. You can also boot using a network share. Uh, part of that is that next one, the PXE, Pixie. That's the pre-boot execution environment. Uh, so you can do an installation over the network using the network share. You can do an installation over the network using uh, Pixie, so on and so forth. 
By the way, I apologize for my dog yipping in the background. He really wants me to play with him. Unfortunately, he's got to wait. So now there are different types of installation. Uh, we have installation via an image. So an image is a snapshot of a system at a given time. It is a complete uh, image. But it can lead to some issues because if you take a snapshot and you don't do anything, you're going to have multiple SIDs, security identifiers. Networks don't like that. Operating systems don't like that. So you need to use a tool that's called SysPrep. And you need to do that right after you configure your reference system because what it does is it strips out the SID before it captures the image. So that when, as soon as you fire up that image, it creates a new SID, you're good to go. You can do an unintended installation. And, and to do that, you use an answer file. And that provides the answers to most of the variables. You can do a partially unintended installation. And what that does is your answer file answers some of the questions. The user answers other questions. Uh, you'll most often see that in the business place. You usually don't see that in the home. So another type of installation is the upgrade. So we talked about the upgrade under objectives 1.1. Also, I really need to say there is make sure that you follow the correct upgrade path so that you don't have problems and to follow the prompts during the upgrade. You can also do a clean install. That means you're going to come up with a machine that has nothing. You're taking a bare box and putting that operating system on it. Uh, repair installation is the last one that we're going to be talking about on installation types. And that is treated like an upgrade. It will require your license key again. Uh, you only do this as a last resort. All of your applications and data gets moved to the windows.old file, which means you need to transfer them back. If you can't find them, uh, don't be surprised if they're missing, unfortunately. So <clears throat> when you're doing an installation, you can also do a multi-group. That allows for multiple operating systems to reside on the same machine. But in order to do that, each operating system must have its own partition on the hard drive, and at boot, the user, you, get to select which one is going to load. On a remote network installation, uh, the installation files actually reside on a remote server. You're going to need a DHCP server, a dynamic host control protocol server, a domain naming ser service server, and a Pixie client in order to do it. And you also need to make sure that you have the proper software license. Uh, Microsoft gets a little bit sticky when you overrun your software license, so make sure that you have room on it. When you're doing an image deployment, when you're using a reference machine and you've taken that snapshot and stripped out the SID and you're going to use it again, you can do it over a network. See above. See the remote network installation. But you can also deploy that image using a USB drive, a DVD, or even a portable hard drive. All of those will work, and you need to know that for the, for the exam. So now let's talk about partitioning hard drives. When somebody talks about a partition, they are actually talking about a volume. And with the volume, they look at your computer, you'll see those drive letters, you know, C, D, E, et cetera, et cetera. Those are volumes. A partition slash volume is the logical division of a hard drive into designated spaces. So now, a hard drive can hold primary or extended volumes, or, or it can use a combination of both. For primary volumes, a hard drive can have four of those. If it has multiple primary volumes, one of those primary volumes is marked as the active volume, and that's the one that your system boots from. Uh, 
a hard drive can have only one extended volume, and what an extended volume allows you to do, by the way, is it allows you to have uh, more than four. So if you have four primary volumes, C, D, E, F, actually you could go C, D, E, and then you put in an extended uh, volume, you could have as many drive letters on that extended volume as you wanted as, as long as you had the room for it. Which brings me to this last point. You can have three primary and one extended on the same hard drive. I'm not sure why you do that. I just tend to use more hard drives, I guess. Now, you can have a basic partition, and a basic partition is where the user establishes the size of the partition. That means when you're setting it up under the drive management system, you specify the size of the partition. That is actually the recommended way to do it. The other way to do it is dynamic partitioning. Um, that's where you allowed your computer to establish the, the size of the volume. And it takes from the storage pool and allocates it via need. I will say that if you're using dy dynamic partitions, you cannot do dual, bo dual booting. Um, it negates that. The last thing you need to know for uh, the CompTIA A plus exam for partitioning is the logical partitions. Uh, those are also sometimes called spanned partitions. And what that is is that's creating a single volume from multiple disks or multiple partitions. Think a redundant array of inexpensive disks. So now let's talk about miscellaneous set setup issues. And the first thing that's there is formatting, quick format versus a full format. A quick format does not check the hard drive for bad sectors before installing the file structure. That's what a full, full format does. It checks the hard drive for bad sectors and marks them before installing the file, file structure. I would only ever recommend doing a quick format if you've already checked for bad sectors and are doing a new installation of the operating system. Other than that, always perform a full format because there's nothing worse than finding out that that brand new hard drive had some bad sectors and now you've got to reinstall your operating system after all that work because it was corrupt because of the bad sectors. So during your system setup, you need to know that you may be required to install third-party drivers. Imagine that. Okay, so now let's talk about work group versus a domain setup. Uh, work groups, we're all pretty familiar with those. Um, that's where you say I belong to this network. It's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer networking st style. Uh, users need an account on each computer that they need access to the resources of. Kind of a pain, that means that if I was to have have access to one of the other computers in my house, I'd have on the network, I'd have to have an account on it, so on and so forth. So, you know, but it does work okay on small networks. Uh, it's a little bit simpler to manage on small networks than a domain would be. Domains are where you have uh, one account and one logon that grants access to all the required or needed resources. You can set user level um, access to resources in a domain. Can't really do that in a work group. So you need to know that when you're doing the setup that you're going to have to input the time, date, region, and language settings. That way your operating system knows what keyboard you have, what time zone you're in, so on and so forth. So you also need to know about Windows Update. Um, unless you know the exact specific specifics of your operating system version, 
you should always run Windows Update right after setup. You'd be surprised at how many updates are required. Actually, probably wouldn't be because we are talking about Microsoft Windows here. It's also recommended that you set up Windows Update to run on a schedule because it will check um, with Microsoft as required and find vulnerable find where your system is vulnerable and recommend updates and patches. It can do that automatically. Thank goodness, or else we'd all probably pull our hair out. The last thing you need to know concerning Objective 1.2 is that a lot of OEM systems have recovery partitions. OEM, by the way, stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer, for those of you who don't know that. And many uh, consumer off-the-shelf systems have recovery partitions instead of systems disks. That means when you open up the box, you pull out the PC, you do not have uh, systems disks. And where they're really residing is on the recovery partition. And that's what you use to bring your PC back in the factory specifications. Unfortunately, it also means that you're going to need to remove all of the crapware again after you do the repair. So that covers exam objectives 1.1 and 1.2 of CompTIA's A-plus exam 220802.